Hi, my name is George Luber. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, thanks to all the folks at Harvard for, for dealing with me and getting me up here. Um, before I get started, I want to make it clear that um, uh, today I am uh, speaking on my own behalf. I, my, uh, what I'm presenting does not represent uh, the position of the Centers for Disease Control. I'm here representing myself and, uh, and my capacity at Emory University. Got that out of the way. Um, but what I've been asked today to talk to you about is a quick overview of the, uh, the health effects of climate change. Now, there are many health effects of climate change. Um, and instead of focusing on the what is affected by climate change, decided to package it a little bit differently and talk about the how those things are affected by climate change. Now, as you've probably heard today, um, there are many dimensions of, of climate change that are relevant for, um, for many impacts, especially health. Um, we see that the average temperature over a period of time for a particular location as it changes is important, as those gradual changes affect ecosystems. But one hallmark of climate change is that it alters the distribution of uh, weather phenomenon. So we get more, ex not only more extreme uh, temperatures and precipitation events, but they, they occur more frequently as well. So the variance as well as the mean is impacted by climate change. And to add to all that confusion, um, there are significant differences regionally in how those impacts are felt. Some wetter places, some wet places are getting wetter, dry places are getting drier, um, and those impacts are, are unevenly felt, even in a place like the United States, the amount of warming, um, let's say you go down to Georgia or Alabama where I'm at, there's almost no warming over the last century, but you go to a place like Minnesota and you have well, greater than three degrees worth of warming, so the impacts vary significantly local, locally, and that's relevant for us in public health because we deal with impacts that occur on the ground. So I'm going to talk to you about three categories of health threats from climate change. Um, these are the kind of how um, uh, health, uh, negative health impacts uh, get realized as a result of these, these changes. Now, first, I'm going to talk about the variance part, how climate change alters the, the frequency of extreme weather events. Now, we experience extreme weather events frequently. <laughs> we have historically. And to tell you the truth, humans are excellent at adapting to different environmental conditions. We occupy almost every ecological niche on the planet except for the deep oceans. And, um, but it's the systems that we build in those places to protect ourselves uh, from health effects, housing, transportation, communication, et cetera, that are challenged when we experience uh, extreme events not only at a greater magnitude than we're accustomed to, which climate change will bring, but also more frequently, that erosive capacity of multiple storms, of multiple insults to, uh, to our infrastructure. And what this has the potential to incur is greater vulnerabilities to those systems that we build. And once those start failing, then we start seeing cascading effects, what we call disasters within a disaster. And those, those become complex emergencies. It's not just about the storm, it's about all the systems that the storm has affected that are gonna, that gonna wind up uh, impacting people's health. And um, this, uh, I think to me personally, was best exemplified with the European heat wave of 2003. Uh, this is actually one where I was sent off by CDC to help the French government. And one of the first things they said is, how could this happen? You know, we have, to call in refrigerated trucks because we cannot manage all of the dead bodies. In France alone, in uh, where we were working with the, the French government, um, they had 14,000 confirmed heat-related deaths. This isn't the total mortality because this is just the people died that died where they could get a core body temperature, where they could ascertain that they were exposed to excessive natural heat. The image on the left shows you how anomalous this heat wave was. They had, the, the summer of 2003 was hotter, <clears throat> way hotter than anything they'd ever experienced ever. And it caught them off guard. They didn't have systems in place to identify the most vulnerable, uh, get them to cooling shelters, um, uh, get uh, other types of cooling uh, mess, like wet, you know, wet sheets and whatnot on the elderly. Um, and they were, they were caught you know, flat-footed completely. They hadn't recalled, in anticipation of this event, physicians from summer vacation. It was August, and everybody goes on vacation in Europe. And so what we ended up with, with a multiple failure by um, federal or the, 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 the national government, local government, um, was a, uh, a very large body count. This is confirmed mortality on the right, which shows you that in, in Western Europe, almost 30,000 people died of, of, of identifiable excessive natural heat. What we did with the French government was look at excess mortality. How many people died during this period, minus the accidental deaths, uh, versus how many we expected to die? And that number is close to 70,000. 
70,000 people died because of an extreme heat event. Um, now, we've worked with them subsequently to identify what you do during these, these types of events in order to get them better prepared, and they are much better prepared now for heat waves. But this multiple system failure uh, can lead to extreme mortality. But let's just make it real, just to simplify it a little bit, even uh, one system failure. So this is, your, uh, this is uh, New York City, same actually, same month, to August 2003 is odd, but they had a power outage um, just a simple power outage caused a spike in non-accidental deaths of 25% and accidental deaths of 120%. This is how rely, re reliant we are on these critical systems that we've built our communities around. Um, and once the power goes out, yes, we can expect this. And this wasn't related to a storm, but you can kind of get the sense that once storms start uh, altering the, those, um, uh, those systems that we, we can get a significant mortality. And it's not limited to things like power outages or infrastructure damage. When you have a storm like Katrina that displaces a lot of people, all those interconnections that people have in their community, from their families and their social network and their, their jobs and whatnot, get broken and fractured. This is a map showing the location of um, the people who left New Orleans, where they ended up in. And you can see this storm shattered, not only shattered a community, but dispersed it around a huge, huge area. And uh, related to this, uh, we were working um, sort of towards the end of 2009 with the city of Austin, Texas. And we said we were working on their hazard vulnerability assessment. What is it in Austin that you're particularly vulnerable to with regards to climate change? <clears throat> I figured wildfires or drought or something like that. And we gave them all the tools they needed to assess what their risks were. We let them cogitate on that. And they came back and they said, our number one threat to cl from climate change is hurricanes. And I said, when was the last time you had a hurricane? They're like, never, we've never had a hurricane. I said, well, why hurricanes? They're like, every time a hurricane hits the Gulf Coast, we get 10,000 people at our doorstep. And they need WIC, they need immunizations, they need housing, they need all of these types of stuff. And that's a big impact on our community. And we feel it every time a storm comes, we have to get ready and get prepared because these people ultimately are gonna need help. And um, in, in implying that these types of disasters have long uh, range effects on, on communities. The second key health threat from cl climate change is a little less newsworthy, I guess, relevant to this group. You know, covering a storm is one thing and seeing the impacts face to face. But it's, as epidemiologists, we poke through the data to find trends that might not be discernible to the naked eye. And this key health threat is actually one of the largest. It's the fact that the, the exposures that we're already experiencing, you know, bad air quality, poor water quality, et cetera, um, are going to be exacerbated by climate change. We're gonna get more bad air quality days. Not perhaps perceptibly so. I mean, uh, to us, yes, we can look at the statistics. However, it's gonna be significant to those people on the ground. Um, this adds to the cumulative stress already experienced by those most vulnerable locations and populations uh, and are gonna get worse. Um, air quality is, is principal among them. We have uh, uh, bad air quality days, uh, 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 yellow uh, alert and red alert days. Uh, and I live in Atlanta in the summertime, um, when we get days over 90, 95, the air quality gets uh, uh, degraded, not only because of when you have a, a really hot day, it's usually associated with a stagnant air mass, uh, but what, the, what happens is that the, the pollutants build up in the air, in the air and um, the smog precursors along with temperature and sunlight produce smog, uh, ozone, I'm sorry, produce ozone. And high ozone days are significant for those most vulnerable. If you're ever exercised outside, in a, in a, even if you're healthy, you're gonna feel the effects of ozone, your scratchy throat, et cetera. Uh, but this affects um, children and the most uh, vulnerable, those with COPD and asthma, et cetera, in really significant ways. And this is a study you know, looking at the change in numbers of ozone days that we will have as a result of climate change. This is the greater New York area. What's it gonna do to projected to do to pediatric ED visits? And this really hits home because this is parents and their kids. And you know when you have a kid who's suffering um, from, from respiratory conditions, but that's, that hits home. And we can see that in these counties that the number of visits to the ED are gonna increase by 10%. And that's, that can have really significant impacts on those with low income. You know, you take a day off of work to take a kid to the ER, not only paying the ER bill, but you're taking a day off of work and that's money lost. So this is an insidious way in which we're gonna have this increased stress uh, upon our communities. Uh, another thing that people uh, might not know about, I don't know if you all know about, is the increase in air allergens. This is another air pollutant that while we can dismiss it as just well run, you know, uh, itchy nose and whatnot, it has significant impacts for those that are sensitive. 
and climate change affects aerallogens, uh, not only in the cumulative amount of, of pollen that's produced because of longer growing seasons, but the CO2 in itself, because we have um, uh, the cause of climate change is excess CO2, um, it stimulates several aer allergenic species in ways that make them produce more of the pollen. That's because in urban areas where most people live, um, we have this effect called the CO2 dome, where you measure globally average background CO2, it's about 415 parts per million. If you were to take a reading outside now, um, it might be closer to 500, 510 parts per million because the urban centers are the production area of, of a lot of the CO2, and it's concentrated in urban areas. Well, this was a study done by a colleague that looked at how this one plant, ambrosia or ragweed, responded to all that, that concentrated CO2. And what he showed was that when you plant a ragweed in an urban plot, I wonder if this works. Oh, I'm even try. Um, the, the large dot on the, on the bottom right, um, the plant that was planted in, in uh, the center, this is Baltimore, produced 12,000 pollen grains per cubic meter of air versus its suburban and rural counterparts, uh, identical plant, same soil, same inputs, et cetera, produced 32 and 2,200 pollen grains. So just by virtue of being in the urban area and exposed to more CO2, it produced a greater, a much greater amount of pollen uh, that, that impacts people. We're seeing this as we do uh, um, collecting data sets, longitudinal data sets of aeroallergenic aer species. We see marked uh, spikes in the amount of production of allergens within um, uh, these urban areas. And this leads to economic costs, treatment costs in the billions. Uh, around the country, and those are increasing rapidly. Um, one thing that gets a lot of attention uh, and does have significant health impacts is uh, wildfire smoke. We tend to focus on the impacts in those communities, the paradise, the, the California, the, the houses burned, people dislocated. But go to the Bay Area and ask them what happened during those fires, and go to the ER and ask them what happened to their ED visits for respiratory conditions, and there are massive spikes in these communities. The downwind effects can be just as significant as uh, the impacts within those communities. And we're seeing an increase in the length of the wildfire season um, and uh, the duration of, um, of, of wildfires as well. Downwind, these have significant impacts. So uh, up to a 1% increase in non-accidental mortality for those communities. Um, there depends on what you burn, but in Australia, for example, they had a 5% increase uh, in uh, mortality and hospital emissions as well. Downwind, it really takes an epidemiologist to poke through the data and say, hey, this is having thousands of people going to the, the ED um, as a result of this fire. Let's not just focus on the fire itself. <clears throat> not only we're we getting an increase in, in drought because temperature leads to greater evaporation, um, et cetera, but we're seeing a change in the nature of rainfall. Increasingly, rain is coming down in shorter bursts. Um, this is what we call heavy precipitation events, and this is the trend across the United States um, that, uh, let me try this, very up here, up the United States, we're seeing significant increase in the observations of rainfall that is anomalous, really on the, on the high end of the distribution. And what we do know um, uh, from looking at past waterborne disease outbreaks is that two-thirds of these, um, of the waterborne disease outbreaks that we identify are preceded by rainfall above the 80th percentile. And we're seeing an increase in those, so we expect to have more waterborne disease outbreaks as a result of, you, you have a heavy rainfall event, it's going to mobilize everything that's on the surface. Everything from agricultural fields, your backyard, and, and add challenging microbes and pathogens into the drinking water system. And in fact, the biggest uh, waterborne disease outbreak in U.S. history, a cryptosporidium outbreak, um, was too preceded by rainfall above the, 50, uh, above the, I'm sorry, preceded by the heaviest rainfall in 50 years. What happened was, you know, this is, this is Wisconsin and the interiors, uh, a lot of agriculture and livestock, had a system that was designed to manage the flow of this, um, these contaminants out of the river and built the intake what was hist uh, previously uh, far enough away from the uh, from the discharge, but with a heavy rainfall event that was unanticipated, that plume that comes into Lake Michigan was too great, and it led to contamination uh, of the water, drinking water system uh, of cryptosporidium, which is not sensitive to chlorination, and caused 405 thousand cases of, of cryptosporidium and 54 deaths. This is because the system here was built uh, for a whole different weather regime. And we need to understand that as you know, these, these events are gonna happen more frequently, that we need to redesign you know, the, the, these uh, systems. The third and final key health threat is that 
we're going to have surprises. You cannot perturb the ecological systems to the degree in which we are without getting some surprises. So novel threats will happen. These might not be novel in the global sense, uh, but they will be novel for a particular region. And that's what is key about the health threats is that we need to develop the tools to anticipate, to get ahead, to say where are things marching and moving so that we can get local public health engaged in order to identify what these threats are. Um, they can be uh, things that you might never heard of. This is uh, harmful algal blooms are increasing because of greater um, uh, inputs uh, from heavy rainfall of nutrients into drinking, uh, into water, both coastal and freshwater, uh, but as well as uh, increased water temperatures help them bloom. This is uh, a uh, formerly tropical harmful algal bloom called Cylindrus spermopsis is the map on the right, uh, and shows you the, the locations of all of the, of where they've identified Cylindrus spermopsis. And this is a pretty potent uh, liver toxin. If it gets into uh, a drinking water system, and currently Cylindrus spermopsis is not regulated or identified in the panel of contaminants that we look for under EPA safe water. Um, this is a threat. We need to identify where these are to get people out if they're, they're um, uh, um, uh, recreating them, et cetera. Um, Lyme disease is another threat, and we see that uh, it's marching. This is a modeling study, marching, 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 projected to march as a result of, of uh, uh, warmer winters, greater numbers of, uh, of ticks overwintering, uh, but as well as uh, a number of other ecological factors that, that expand its, its, uh, the habitat for the, the tick that transmits Lyme. This is actual case distribution map of, uh, that CDC produces of where we find Lyme, and this is 1996, and this is 2011. And the more recent maps, again, just follow this same trend. So this is its mar marching, and we just have to get it under um, uh, surveillance in, in, in a better way. Um, the last one I'm gonna talk about is uh, food security under, under climate change. And this is the big thing in the room here because if you don't have adequate food and nutrition, you don't have healthy immune systems and the rest of public health doesn't matter. Um, we're seeing that uh, food security is a, t is, is a challenge not just by temperatures and precipitation and weather changes, but also by the CO2 itself. This is perhaps the, most, the scariest slide in the whole deck. And what it shows, it is, it's absolutely frightening. What this shows is that if you grow crops, these are the ones that feed the world, basically, under, with, without any changes to temperature, weather, precipitation, et cetera, under elevated CO2 levels, that their amount of crude protein that's available in these, these plants is reduced by up 15 to 20%. So if we imagine a world, and we will have this by the end of the century, of 550, 600 parts per million CO2, we're going to have crops that are failing to provide adequate nutrition uh, because of the stress that the CO2 has on these C3, C4 photosynthetic pathways. And not only does it affect the protein, but it affects micronutrients as well, zinc, iron, um, numbers of other of, 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 um, of, of vitamins, et cetera. Meaning on a planet, not with 7 billion, but with 9 billion people, and elevated CO2 at 600 parts per million, we're gonna have a nutritional crisis. Um, and this is intractable. We can adapt to weather, right? We can retreat from the coasts. We can build better water, drinking water systems. We can do all that that we need to do. How do we solve the carbon problem? Because this is an effect of climate change that has nothing to do with climate. It has nothing to do with weather. This is an intractable, I hope intra not intractable, but a fact that is, is going to challenge the world. So to conclude, the numerous dimensions of climate change, from temperatures to extreme weather to sea level rise and increasing CO2 level, affect a whole variety of exposures, air quality, water quality, environmental degradation, extreme heat, which in turn affect a wide amount of health effects as well. And this is the grand challenge. As Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, organization said, the single greatest threat to public health in the 21st century. Thank you. Across the river for WBUR, where I cover health care. I'm going to be joined on the stage by Mary Rice, who's a pulmonologist and a critical care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess, also just across the river. And by Natalina, Natalia. Yes. Natalia Linos who's the executive director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. George, thank you so much. Lots to jump off of there. We're going to try to stay focused. What's that? That's big too fast. <laughs> We're going to try to stay focused on um, the patient and person perspective as much as we can from here on out. So I thought I would start with asking um, Mary and Natalia to 
Think of a story that comes to mind as you listen to George's rich presentation. Mary, perhaps you on um, air pollution or increased mm -hmm. allergens. Sure. Um, I'm going to tell you a patient story. Great. And I could certainly tell stories about allergens, but the, the one that comes to mind is a, a patient of mine that I saw in the hospital last summer. And uh, so I, I see patients in pulmonary clinic and I see patients in the ICU. And this patient was on the medical floor. She's one of my clinic patients with COPD. Really bad emphysema, has a really hard time breathing. And, and I got called by the house staff saying she's been admitted with a COPD exacerbation. Can you come and see her? It was, during, it was in August during one of those really, one of, the big, one of the heat waves that we had last summer. And when I asked her what brought her in, she said, well, I was so hot and I just felt like I couldn't move. I was just exhausted. And then when I looked at her lab data, her sodium was all messed up, and she was really wheezy, but it actually didn't start with her lung disease. It started with her feeling terrible because she was so hot, and she's already really limited, so she didn't take her medications properly. She didn't hydrate properly. She didn't eat properly. She ended up in the hospital because she was exhausted, and it all really started with the heat. And so the diagnosis for her admission is a COPD exacerbation, but if she hadn't been all wiped out, she would have taken her meds. She might have called me saying she felt a little bit wheezier. But what really brought her in was the weather. And I think you know, climate change is going to be nowhere on that admission note, or it's not going to be a diagnosis or even a cause of her admission. Uh, but it clearly played a role in what bumped her over the edge and, and got her into the hospital. Thanks. Talia? So I've spent the last 10 years in the UN system. I, in 2003, I moved to Beirut, and I expected my life to be sort of a UN staff going everywhere. And a few years ago, I had kids, and I became kind of a lead on climate and health for the UN. And I read all the data that you presented. And that, from a personal perspective, that has shaped every decision I have made since. I was trying to get pregnant. It was during the Zika outbreak. I didn't, you know, I had to sacrifice going on mission to Latin America. Recently, they asked me to go in a posting to be based in Nepal. I looked at the air quality data because my kids, you know, I'd be bringing my family. I chose not to. So two months ago, I moved to Boston, in large part to take on this executive director role because I can't put my kids at risk. And what that has taught me is that I am in a super privileged position to be able to make these decisions, whether to travel, if to travel, how to protect my family from air pollution, and has made me a little bit more conscious of the, the social justice component of the climate and health, whether it's in the US from a racial justice, but from a global perspective, meeting with youth activists, and I hope I can get into that, you know, from the Marshall Islands, who said, for us, it's not you know, whether we go to the hospital or not. It's our entire country going under. And, and really recognizing that this is um, such a fundamental that changes my behavior as well as you know, patients' behavior. And I'm not a clinician, but this has become, you know, I, I was not a climate person maybe five years ago, and now I am. Hmm. Yeah. So we know that the impacts of all of the um, research that George talked about will hit different parts of the world differently. So yeah. can you give us one example of um, an unequal impact of climate change and maybe something the UN has done to try to address that? I mean, for the UN, the small island developing states are the ones that, you know, have the the most to lose, uh, but it's not only them. So, you know, I met with the Minister of Health of Fiji and he said, can the UN help us in uh, basically dealing with our hospitals so that if there's salt because of seawater rise, we don't ruin all our equipment? You know, what can you do? Similarly in Africa, um, in Zimbabwe and other places where we've been doing HIV work, um, Ari mentioned about sort of the, you know, vaccinations. When you are on ART or in any other sort of daily dose where you, you know, to to control your HIV, you need the chain, the cold chain. So we've been putting solar panels on storage facilities to enable them to function during you know, shortages or if uh, there's a weather emergency. I mean, from the UN, the disaster risk reduction is key, uh, but the inequities are, are tremendous. And, and countries like low income and low resource countries are saying, you know, you, we did not cause this and we are bearing the the brunt of this, and you know, there is a demand from the U.S. to take leadership, and that's what's so depressing um, to see sort of the U.S. stance right now. Not only not doing enough for their own people, but also taking this global kind of like, you know, stepping stepping away from Paris. Mary George touched briefly on the um, 
increased uh, potency of some of the mm -hmm. allergens. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that in your patients yet? For sure. So, I, you know, I, I, I kind of wear two hats because I am an epidemiologist. I study the data. But anecdotally, seeing my, I see adults with lung disease, a lot of adults with asthma and, and allergy, and I see people coming in earlier with symptoms, and we can see from the data that the pollen season's longer, and having a lot of trouble with uh, controlling their allergic symptoms. So calling me, asking for more drugs to manage their, their asthma or their allergy. So I, f I, I find that I'm prescribing more uh, to treat those symptoms. And I find that I'm starting to start those medications earlier. Are, the, are pharmaceutical firms starting to change or adjust meds at all in recognition of this? Well, pharmaceutical companies um, are all about marketing and treating symptoms of allergy because it's a huge market. I mean, about 30% of the population has seasonal allergies. So um, I don't know if we can say that they are changing their approach because of uh, climate change, but they, I'm sure they are seeing their market growing. The and there, um, there's a lot of drugs on the market. Um, and there's actually new drugs for, aller for asthma that specifically target the more allergic asthmatics. And those... And there's been a huge boom in those those drugs um, because they didn't used to exist before. Biologic drugs that you inject, um, that you can inject yourself or coming into the hospital. Really expensive drugs, actually, so real money makers for pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical companies. So that's been it. Yeah, I can't say that those new drugs have emerged right. because of climate yeah. change, but there is a huge... The, I think the allergy issue is one that, on the one hand, it seems like, oh, it's just sniffly noses. Uh, but it, it, it's one of the major reasons people visit their doctors. It is a re major reason for people staying home from work, and it's a major trigger for asthma attacks. And asthma attacks are a big deal, and that definitely keeps people home. George, I wanted to come back to the last slide about um, the um, degradation of nutrients in foods. Mm -hmm. Are there particular crops where that will be most apparent? And also, could you just give us a little more of the science of how that's happening? Um, the uh, yes, the the C three photosynthetic plants, the grasses, are affected by, and, and I showed it with uh, the ragweed as well. It stimulates plants in different ways. Uh, ironically, leads to greater biomass in cer in certain cases where the plants they grow bigger and they, you know fatter, but it stresses them out in that in in that growth pathway and compromises certain parts of, uh, of its, its nutrition. We're talking corn, rice, yeah, everything? Yeah, uh, wheat, barley, uh, corn, rice, a, a whole range. Uh, that was just a, a simple little um, uh, list of, of plants. But uh, not all of uh, the, most of the starches, for example, are effect, which are important uh, you know, uh, sources of nutrients for a lot of the world. and. Uh, they uh, are showing the less crude protein, micronutrients as well. And it's funny because I teach um, uh, this topic at, uh, at Emory, and we have this big debate about, because you know, a lot of the, the younger kids are anti-GMO. And I say, well, what is, it, what is your opinion about GMO now that we've, that we've dived into this a little bit more? And they just say, gosh, we're going to need all these tools in order to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> kind of engin engineer plants that will be able to handle high CO2. And that phenomenon, which is, you know, affects uh, uh, plant life, it, I mean, it affects a number of things, you know, like even poison ivy, if you grow it under high CO2, produces more of its allergenic compound, urushiol. But the big thing is those crops that we rely on to feed the world, as well as the impact that excess CO2 has on the ocean, which uh, the ocean absorbs CO2, and it, it will and is, has already acidified because of its absorption of um, CO2. And if it continues much further or to a, a greater extent, it can compromise the ability of the, we call calcareous organisms. These are ones that build, that need, that construct exoskeletons in order to survive the, the food base of the ocean, zooplankton, phytoplankton, um, and the tiny little crustacean-y things. Um, they're unable to, to form hard exoskeletons as well, they get soft and populations can decline. And if that's what feeds the, the base of the food base of the ocean, uh, we could see a collapse in marine ecosystems as well, um, which is another huge contributor to human nutrition. Um, and again, that's not related to weather. 
as it's just a carbon pollution problem. And all of these uh, geoengineering um, fantasies about you know solar particle distribution and whatnot um, won't do a thing for that. That's uh, it's a carbon pollution problem fundamentally. Right. Why are children most at risk for the effects of climate change? Dalia, do you want to start? Mm. I don't know if I'd be the best. I'm the least uh, clinical of these. So the why I don't okay. know. Um, I have a different. Um, point about children, so maybe I'll pass to them, which is, I kind of, so in my current role at the Center for Health and Human Rights, we look a lot at um, kind of the rights of children. There's the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is turning 30, um, 30 years just next week. And sort of the rights of children, I think, is something that we need to prioritize. And the rights of children to be to participate in decisions that will impact their lives. So I think children are critical to the climate change policy discussion because it is really fundamentally about their future, the world that we're leaving them, and their right to protest, to be on the streets. And I'm, I see so much hope from the youth movement, but I also see so much despair. And kind of, I'd love to touch a little bit on the mental health side of it because, um, you know, we are yeah, sort of expecting, Take it. is we'll it okay? That. Yeah, yeah, we're expecting, you know, Greta to be on the streets or all these kids to be on the streets and, you know, and what I'm hearing from them, we've met with some groups small, is that they are being threatened in social media, you know, with rape, especially because it's a lot of girls in the front line of the movement. You know, I'm going to rape you or I'm going to hurt you. And, you know, kind of the, the toll that is taken on them to be the activists, to be the adults in the room, we're not owning that. I'm also seeing despair among 18-year-olds in the U.S. who are not really the ones who are going to be impacted the most because they are privileged to maybe move or have these conditions. We're saying, why do I need to care about my future? I don't care what I become because right now this is an existential threat and I need to focus on this. So I think the rights I don't of the care child... About what, I don't care about my what, career? My career. Yeah, really? they are flat out saying that, that, you know, I am 14 and I need to focus on this. I will miss school. I, you know, it doesn't matter. So I feel like we're, we're kind of forcing on a generation this kind of, you know, find the solution, be our hope, we as adults. You know, you are our future and we're not recognizing what we're doing to them from a mental health, from a, from a future perspective. So I'm very much concerned that that has been understudied. Obviously also the mental health impacts of those who are dealing with disasters. So you're fleeing or you've had a hurricane. I mean, that's clearly a mental health need, but also the kind of the eco-anxiety that's going on. So I think going back to sort of my, my current hat, which has a human rights phrase, the, the Convention on the Right to the Child, like we really need to see what we are doing to children <coughs> and what we are depriving in terms of their human rights um, because we are failing on the climate change discussion. That's a good point. I mean, the, I cut out a few slides on the mental health impacts, but yeah. those are not insubstantial. No. Not ju just re uh, following a storm, tremendous burden of disease. If we would quantify the burden of disease from a storm, you do have the direct impacts, usually not so great, more injury, whatever, following a storm with a cleanup. But then if you were to take the whole universe of health effects related to that storm, it's mental health and PTSD and intimate partner violence, drug and alcohol abuse, et cetera, that happens for months and years afterwards. And that is huge. Mm -hmm. But Mary, I think you struggle a lot with when and how to talk to patients about climate change, mm -hmm. right? It's not sort of an obvious thing to bring up. Um, in an exam room. Right, yeah, I mean, just like that example of the, the patient that I saw. I mean, it, Did you talk to her about climate change? Um, I talked to her about the heat wave. Uh -huh. I said, it looks like the heat wave is what brought you in. You know, actually, I think I might have <clears throat> with her. She's one of my favorite patients, actually, so we probably <laughs> chatted about it. Uh, but it, it, it can be tricky, right? You have limited time for the patient-doctor interaction. Um, and the, sort of the clinical face of climate change doesn't have climate change written all over it, right? The fact is, our whole environment is changing, and it's changing um, weather patterns in a way that increase risks of bad things happening, right? That's the way I kind of think about it. It increases the chances of somebody ending up in the hospital with their COPD or with their asthma, or even with their heart attack, like things that, um, it increases, it affects the air quality, that increases the risk of stroke and heart attack and premature death. So many, um, it's, the, it's like we're changing the balance of things um, in a way that we, we know from the science is going to make a lot of these health effects more likely. And then when we see those health effects on the clinical side in the hospital, they don't have climate change written all over them. 
But we're seeing those patterns when we look at the data, when we have a wildfire, we see those spikes in the respiratory admissions, right? That's the face of climate change. That's the clinical face of it. Um, those are the cases. Do you worry about alien? I'm sorry. I just yeah. wanted to yeah. add to that in terms of <laughs> linking it to the previous panel. Uh, at the UN, we've been very interested about credi credible messengers and the yeah. literature that says that clinicians, I think nurses over doctors, are like the most trusted um, <laughs> messenger. But maybe we're second. Second, you're okay. second, you're second. And nurses over doctors. <laughs> yes, in the US at least. That I think that's what the, it's me. nurses and doctors. And then, you know, politicians are like way at the bottom. Teachers are up high. So kind of how do we use credible messengers, whether it's within your clinic practice, maybe those 15 minutes aren't enough. Right. But you, I mean, I, I think off stage, you mentioned that you testified in Congress, like using you in these bigger mm -hmm. kind of conversations. And at the global level, I think doctors have even more of a, oh, you are a doctor, especially in countries where there are very few doctors. They have the privilege of not being part of the political yeah. Um, sort of establishment, but they are elite and they have kind of credibility. So the, the role of doctors in moving this discussion, I think, is pretty, pretty critical, whether it's in the <clears throat> clinic or outside. Yeah, I mean, I agree yeah. with you. I've been pushing that a lot, um, and there's clear data. When you look at these lists, uh, the ones I've seen, the politicians are way below the doctors. The doctors are among the tops. And the, sci the scientists are a little bit below the doctors, generally speaking. So we do have kind of a special place in society. But I do think among my peers, my clinical peers, there's some discomfort too, right? Because we want to say, you are here because you had a heart attack, right? And we know that you have a heart attack because of this lab test and this, you know, EKG. or. Um, there's discomfort among doctors, I think, of saying, we know you're here because of climate change. And I do think, as reporters, um, there is a role that you can play in, in saying, drawing these connections um, in the face of scientists and doctors' discomfort sometimes, and, and saying, this is because of this one case. And I think. This is something, a point I'd like to, to make in this panel is there's this dichotomy of this is due to climate change and this, you know, this, this storm is a climate change storm and that's a not climate change storm. Or this is a climate change heart attack and that one's not. That dichotomy isn't true, right? It, that's not how things work. And so I do think as journalists you have a role to say heart attacks are more likely because of uh, the, the wildfires that we're having. That we know, um, and we don't have to always draw the label. This is a this is a climate change heart attack, and this is a non climate change heart attack. Turning it over to you, who wants to start? I've got a couple more while you think about it. Yeah, one over here. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the uh, about the mental health impacts of climate change, um, and I don't know if anybody has the answer to this, but. So one of the things I noticed when Greta uh, Thunberg talks about the mental health impact, she talks a lot about how before she was in activism, she was really depressed. And she was really, like, the reason that she started the strike was because she couldn't even go to school. She couldn't think, it's like what you were saying. Like, she couldn't even think about what she wanted to be when she grew up, right? It put her in a sense of despair. <clears throat> and then one of the things I noticed that she says a lot now is that the activism the feeling like she's doing something about climate change. She doesn't want to be doing this. She wants to be back in school and all that stuff. But that's actually really helped bring her out of her mm -hmm. depression. And I think about that in terms of storytelling, because we talk a lot about um, how do we avoid gloom and so much gloom and doom stories on these like mental, especially on these mental health stories. Like, oh, children are being messed up by climate change. Like, their, their mental health is suffering. Um, and that's documented in scientific literature and medical research. I'm wondering if there's any documentation to show uh, that that activism, that, that, or that even like being catalyzed to solve a problem that's ailing you um, improves your mental health or could, could take you out of that. Yeah, um, I can answer that. The, um, a couple, maybe seven, eight years ago, I was asked to participate in a longitudinal study, a study that I'd be contacted periodically, looking at the effects of um, 
climate change on those who study climate change. <laughs> Dead serious. And they were like, you know, how does this bum you out if you, you know, you're, because I think it is my job to study and document in minute detail the demise of the human species. I mean, not kidding. You know, when you look at all of the different health effects and all the challenges and they build up, it's like, wow, we're taking notes as this is happening and in documenting. I mean, it's essentially, we're trying to stop it, of course, but these, some of these problems like I'm showing you, if we don't do anything are intractable and surmountable. I, I don't understand how we could have a, a, a viable planet with uh, 800 parts per million CO2. I just don't. Um, and thank God I'm not on the government time today. <laughs> but um, uh, but so but I have always thought uh, you know responded to those things. You're like I'm doing something about it. However Sisyphean it might feel, um, it is uh, it, it does you know give me energy, and I know that I'm actually working on something that is significant and, and whatnot. And that's bummed me out over the last uh, year and a half where I've been unable to, to to work on that. I am on the side and doing a bunch of other things, but um, uh, it does you know engaging is the best therapy. For, for me at least, and I think for people like Greta and a lot of other kids, and good for them. And I can add to that that there is the analogy with sort of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement and, you know, racism harms um, people very much so. And I think for people who are out there speaking about racism, it is an empowering. But I do, I do think that burnout can happen from the activists I've been speaking to. I do think the response of the media and others, like how we treat them, do we really give them a voice in the public discourse? And that's why I, I talked about the Convention of the Right to the Child. These children have a right. Um, I mean, the U.S. has not ratified the convention, but every other country has. So any international child has the right to participate in public discourse. It is their human right. It's encouraged. And they have the right to try and sway policy. So I think as long as, you know, the, your reporting really gives them, elevates them, is not in a patronizing way. Uh, you stop the criticism of, like, Greta, you look this way, or Greta, you know, why are you so gloomy? And I, can I just add something about Greta from, I think, from a public health community, the fact that she's been so vocal about her autism and how that has helped her um, basically not be able to ignore the facts. Like, she was like, you know, I am autistic. I don't look, read social cues. Everybody else is like, yeah, the world is coming to an end, but everybody seems calm. It's fine. But she's like, I'm autistic. I can't read those social cues, and I just see the data. I think it's been really good for the sort of the non-neurotypical kind of the, the autism world, too. So she is a superstar both on the climate stage and from the public health stage. But, you know, she's not alone. There are a lot of voices from the global south, too, and I'd love those to be elevated from in your coverage. Hi. Um, so this discussion has made me really interested to think about uh, both from state health systems and hospital health systems how they're preparing um, for these sorts of things, whether it's a direct hit or sort of what you were talking about in terms of uh, one city is hit but it impacts another and, and people dis dispersing. Um, what questions would you all ask of either state health systems or hospitals to see if they're prepared? What would you want to know? Um, to assess their preparedness to deal with the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on where the system's located, but coastal areas, are you, how, are you prepared for flooding? Are your electrical systems in the basement or on the top of the hospital? Um, I know that uh, some of the earlier hurricanes that really hit healthcare systems. I know Katrina, mm -hmm. and then what happened in, in NYU, they had to shut down all of Bellevue for a long time and evacuate patients and research supplies. And then they, when they redid the hospital, they put all of their electrical stuff up top so that they're ready. So uh, you, how are you prepared for climate change? What are you going to do uh, when the next hurricane hits? So that's what yeah. we were we're doing it at CDC, and you can't ask that question <laughs> unless you've asked them the first question. Have you engaged uh, climate change projections for your region? And uh, if they haven't, then they're not prepared at all, because the effects that they might experience as a result of climate change might be novel, novel um, exposures. An example is the city of Multnomah County or Portland, Oregon. We worked with them. They're one of our grantees, and we assessed ret uh, climate retrospectively and prospectively. What have they experienced? What will they experience in the future? And for the Pacific Northwest, one of the greatest changes is the frequency of hot weather days, right? They don't really have hot weather, uh, heat, hot and high temperature days. But it was projected that that part of the country, more so than just about any other, was going to experience heat waves. So they, being Portland said, we should get going on this. What do we do for a heat response plan? And they did, and they we have heat response plans that we developed for other cities, Chicago and whatnot, and they looked at it and they said, okay, if it's a high heat day, we need to do this, 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 and this. And there was 
by gosh, the very next year, a heat wave forecast for the weekend where they have this Parade of Roses, which is a big event in Portland. And there was a race, a running race, and the marching, and all kinds of stuff. And they opened their plan up and said, we've never had this before, but now we're ready. And they moved the start time of the race. They moved other things and canceled this and that and moved at different times of the day. And they had no problem where they would have had they gone ahead as, as usual. So you can't ask, are you ready for climate change unless you've actually looked at what climate change will do because it, it will change things in ways like Paris that you will be unprepared for. Um, the past is not prologues, is what I was saying. I can, ask how can I just add to, sorry, to no, that, no. the equity dimension? I think that if you are a journalist and you're going to ask it, ask them, have you thought about who are the most vulnerable in your community? Where do they live? Are the ones on, say, yeah. the cancer patients? And, and I think that equity analysis is actually quite different because it might give you a different answer. In well, New York City, I worked at the health department mm -hmm. briefly, and they kind of looked at, you know, who would be most impacted and then also who has the means to say has a car and can go away if there's an emergency versus who doesn't have a car. And sort of that equity dimension, I think, would be critical. Yeah, and that's okay. we, when we, this whole plan we call the BRACE framework, building resilience against climate effects. It starts with looking at the climate data and models, vulnerability assessment, what do your population structure look like? You know, what, what, what is your population like? Then you look at disease burden projection. There's a whole five-step process, which we have been working with grantees to, to do, or did, um, that would arrive at this really knowledgeable, evidence-based um, assessment of what our, our risk to climate change will be and, and what do we do about it. At the back, and then who's next? Over here, great, oh, thanks. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if you guys have any suggestions or strategies for how journalists like us could find people who are, who could trace their effects, their, their health issues to climate change. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rice, you mentioned the uh, patient earlier. Yeah. You can't tell us her name because no. there's uh, there are laws that yeah. and everything. And so well. you know, we can we can report on statistical <laughs> issues and, and whatnot, but getting yeah. down to the personal anecdotal level is incredibly difficult. Well, you can get those names with the right permission. So that's actually how I met Martha Beepinger because she tracked me down and said, Do you ever talk to your patients about climate change? And I said a little bit for like a few seconds here and there when I can, um, and she said, "I'd like to, I'd like to see uh, record you um, talking to how you talk to your patients, your lung patients about climate change." So uh, she came and visited me in my my clinic, and the first patient, and they signed forms, so their names were released. They were on NPR, and uh, the first patient was an asthmatic with allergy, and she talked about her allergy symptoms and uh, how they were getting worse and starting earlier. And the next patient was like the story I just shared, a very fragile patient with COPD who struggles to walk around. And when it's hot, he just can't leave the house. And we talked about that. Um, so those stories are there. But I do think you have to be proactive because those patients didn't call those climate change symptoms, right? They're talking about allergy. They're talking about heat. Um, and so I think you do have to be proactive in uh, helping, just as I'm trying to be proactive as a doctor and trying to encourage my colleagues in the medical field to be proactive in identifying this as climate change related, um, I think you have a role to play there too in finding those stories and helping patients realize that they're having symptoms that are more common uh, because of climate change. <laughs> Make the introduction. Well, how do you find? Do you, do you do you report on clinical stories at all? Um, Medical problems. You know, we do. do you... uh, it's difficult uh, mm -hmm. getting in touch with anyone who's got yeah. some sort of a medical uh, issue. You have to basically get their permission yeah. it's directly true. from them, and, and you know, and, and there seems to be an added dimension <clears throat> of difficulty here because now you know when you're talking to somebody who lives next to a toxic waste dump and they've got cancer, well, you can kind of make that correlation immediately uh, to some degree, or they can, or they can talk about that. But when you're talking to somebody who has COPD issues or they've got asthma-related issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the it doesn't seem like the climate change uh, sort of frame is right immediately right. there for them. And yeah, not necessarily it may not be in their mind. And ironically, I mean, the patient living close to the waste dump who has cancer, I'd say the chances of their cancer being due to the waste dump are a lot lower than somebody with COPD having more symptoms due to the heat being due to the fact that we have 
more heat, <laughs> which is a result of climate change. I, I think if you contact doctors and ask for climate change patients, you're not going to find any, right? You, I know, Martha, you made a bunch of phone calls before you found me. So I wouldn't go that point. I would say if you have doctor connections, you're looking for stories of people with allergy or with, uh, with COPD. Pick the medical problem and then talk to them about how it's affected by weather. My patients all report weather-related changes in their symptoms. That's a really common. Here, oh, sorry, here, and then back to you. Um, you've, spoke, you've all kind of spoken about effects on air quality and crop nutrient value and, and food uh, scarcity or food uh, consequences of climate change. But I'm curious from each of you how you feel that the media coverage of the um, Flint, Michigan water crisis what, what were the kind of health holes in coverage, and what did that crisis kind of make you think of in terms of our water um, <coughs> in general? What are you scared of about it? I, I, don't, I don't think I followed that. I mean, uh, we, the group I'm, I, I sit in was, response, was the response group for Flint, and that was, you know, I, I, in so many levels, just not done right. I don't know about the media coverage of it. I didn't, didn't, don't follow in the media very much. I mean, sorry, I do read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but, a hardcover? You actually read a paper? <laughs> on the line, but... Oh. Um, <laughs> so as far as how the media covered, I don't know. I mean, this was a tragedy that, that uh, was, was, you know, could have been easily avoided uh, had, you know, some proper consultation taken place, and I just think people dropped the ball. I mean, that's how it, yeah, you know, it's happened on the ground, not the media coverage. Yeah. Passing it. Hi. Yeah. Um, this is for you, Dr. Wright. In your practice, mm -hmm. is there any way to measure somehow how involved or proactive are the doctors in your practice or the state or the country with climate change? Mm. I mean, how do they talk usually to their patients? And mm. when you do, do you do recommendations about, I don't know, mm. other related issues, so uh, solutions? Yeah, or? that's a good question. So doctors are proactive, I'd say, politically around climate change. There's uh, different groups of uh, physicians. Um, there's Physicians for Policy Action right here based in Boston, Union of Concerned Science, Scientists, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, I am very involved in my professional organization, the American Thoracic Society. That's a professional organization of lung doctors and critical care doctors. And we uh, are very involved in policies around climate and air quality. And so that's one piece where I think doctors, not all doctors, but many doctors are very engaged and very concerned. Um, when it comes to the clinical practice, it does get tricky because on the one hand, I feel conflicted because this is a problem. Patients can't solve this problem, mm -hmm. right? They can't. I mean, we, we do need, we need individual action, but we need policy action, right? We need major transformative change in the way our economy works. Um, so on the one hand, I'm very passionate about trying to encourage that change and trying to get doctors to talk about how this is a real problem affecting real people. It's not just data and numbers that sometimes make people's heads spin. It's real kids coming in the hospital with asthma attacks. And we, we know what that means, and we should be talking about that more. For patients, I do think, in part, Martha changed my thinking about this a little bit. And going through that exercise, I realized, well, maybe there is, not everyone's going to be an av advocate. We're not all, you know, we have our different strengths and weaknesses. and. Um, most doctors aren't going to be politically active in that way. I think that's the reality. But maybe there really is a role to play in the clinical environment in changing the way people think about this and trying to draw those connections a bit. It is really hard. I mean, my, my visit slots are 20 minutes. You've got to cover their symptoms, the changes, their medications, you know, differences in coverage. Some medications aren't covered. You know, it's a lot in 20 minutes to cover. A new category yeah. between the doctors and patients about this in centers, medical centers and practices. Say that one more time. Like, it is possible to create, or is there any space for a new category of 
people talking mm -hmm. about this climate change issues at medical centers. Yes. I mean, is there a Besides need for more of it? 20 minutes and that. Yeah. Sure. I can, I can yeah, jump in on ahead. this a little bit. I think some examples, there's been a lot of uh, understanding in the medical community of the social determinants of health. This includes <laughs> you know, homelessness or if you're a victim of sort of violence at home. And there have been really innovative initiatives where at the clinic you have like legal professionals or housing people who come in so that the doctor can sort of say, you know, your fundamental problem here is is really the fact that you are homeless or that you're living in extreme poverty. And there has mm -hmm. been that linkage across communities on the social determinants of health, I think less so on the climate and environmental. So maybe looking at some of those models yeah. um, would be a way forward. I don't mm -hmm. think it exists right now. And I don't know what there it would some be, examples. but maybe there's some examples, but mm -hmm. that could be a way. It's just that homelessness is so much more direct and you're sort of solving their immediate two problems that whereas the, on the climate change, I do think this kind of idea of like, you're not gonna be solving it through individual change. and that powerlessness, I think, maybe is, mm -hmm. is unfair to put on the patient. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They, I will mention, um, MGH has this, I don't know if they've done it yet, but they have a grant to hand out iPads in emergency rooms that would give you a little teach-in on climate change. And some of the pediatric offices are starting to do something similar with games on, on iPads. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. It's sort of a follow-up okay. to that, too, because I know you talked about, Dr. Rice, you talked about just, like, there's sort of a discomfort sometimes in, mm -hmm. in bringing up um, in bringing up climate change to patients. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have to assume that that's because of the political nature that climate change has taken on. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, it made me have this thought, and I wrote it down, I wanted to just see if you agreed with it. <laughs> and, like, it's good. and I was just like, oh my God, like, so, because, well, okay, so why is climate change seen as political among patients? Like, in my mind, it's because you know, of a mass 30-year disinformation campaign to 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 sow climate to sow doubt about established climate science and to make it political. So, mm -hmm. is one of the effects of this <coughs> disinformation campaign is that it's made doctors reluctant to share factual information with their patients because they're scared about how patients might react? Yes, okay. I would agree with you. Yeah, great. I would agree with you. I think yeah, the the disinformation campaign made climate change a political, controversial topic. It took Evidence that's, uh, the last panel talked about how there's no controversy anymore about the fact that climate change is happening, right? This is not a debatable scientific issue. There's issues around the margins that could be debated, but the fact that it's happening, not debatable, that's science. So that's an area where doctors should be really comfortable now saying that, yes, our climate is warming. We're gonna have more heat waves. We're gonna have warmer springs, that's right? And why? <laughs> Is it because of that, like, doctors aren't telling patients, like, a critical yeah. health thing that they need to know? But is the patient-doctor uh, yeah. interaction the, the right place to do that? I mean, if yeah. I went to my doctor and he started talking about climate change, I'm like, dude, I got a problem got here. Stuff to cover. You know, you, let me tell you about a different problem. <laughs> yeah. You got more problems than you know to deal with. Uh, I, I, maybe there's a way that physicians can, you know, convey this information without cramming it into her, her the valuable 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I wrote a, a textbook with a, 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 a physician, and we aimed it at medical school and school of public health um, uh, classes on climate and health. And he really, his name is Jay Lammer, he really wanted to get in there this getting physicians involved in the clinical interaction. And we call it the five C's, the core clinical competencies for climate change. <laughs> and um, and I was just like, is this going to work? Is Are we going to not just politicize, but... Hey, uh, Doc, I've got a problem here. I want you, let's not talk about anything else. I want to hear about your 401k or anything. Focus on me and not, you know, edgy on this. It's related. I, you know, I was saying maybe it should be like stuff in the, we were talking about the, the, the waiting room or yeah, something. Yeah, information. Did you know sheets. that all you, in a pulmonary, pulmonologist office, these are drivers of your of your risks. Might want to leaf these over or something. And just by virtue yeah. of being in a doctor's office, it might help. Yeah. I don't know if the patient doctor interaction is the right place. Yeah. It's really, really squeezed tight. And the no amount of practical advice that you can really give people really narrows down to things like temperature and treating their symptoms, which you're talking about anyway. So, but when I was trying to figure out, when I was a, a pulmonary fellow trying to figure out what I wanted to study, I wanted to study the health effects of climate change. And uh, many of my scientific peers pushed me towards air pollution rather than climate because 
uh, it was seen even then, about 10 years ago, as something controversial, right? That you don't, as a scientist, you don't want to. Yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time uh, giving grand rounds, which is a talk to medical students at various, you know, universities around the country, and uh, starting like about 2009. And I can't tell. I mean, medical physicians, medical students are very focused in their studies. They go through college with very the narrow tunnel of the, of information, very deep into that tunnel, but you know, not they're not exploring other topics like a, perhaps a liberal arts education might. And I can't tell you how many people after I give my talk on climate change come up to me and go, oh my God, I thought this was a hoax. Oh. No, I'm dead serious. Like I did not think climate change was for real. Like I hadn't even looked at it because I'm so focused on, you know, on, on medicine. Many, many, many at very big schools. And uh, I was like, wow, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, that's present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> at the back. That it's changing your practice in terms of seeing more incidences related to air quality. But I'm also wondering how you think climate change might change the practice of medicine in general. For example, like, you know, with warming, is it going to change sort of the, the way that we've always looked at what the flu season is or, um, or just, you know, think, things like that? Is it going to end up, um, like, do you think it could sort of change the practice of how we traditionally have seen patients? Well, I think just as you had that slide in your presentation about unexpected things, I mean, I think infectious disease is one of the most complicated areas of medicine, and I think no one really has a crystal ball to know how different disease vectors are going to be affected right, by changes in ecosystem and temperature. So I think, I mean, we've already seen some unexpected, like you mentioned, the Zika virus, uh, you know, nobody saw that coming. So, um, so that could happen. Um, I think, um, but I think there's other ways that are very predictable. Like we, we can anticipate that we're going to have more spread of infectious disease during extreme weather events and crowding when people are displaced. And, and we can anticipate that we're going to have more respiratory emissions during wildfire events. Um, and so, yeah, the healthcare system is going to have to, we have no choice, but we're going to have to manage all of that. Something I wanted to add to that, at, there is a big movement um, on the healthcare system to also reduce their carbon footprint. In this country, yeah. I think healthcare contributes to like 10 percent, is yeah, that huge. correct? Yeah. Of the carbon emissions. So there's a lot that healthcare, you know, because of this increase of doctors like yourself, um, the CEOs of a big hospital could decide to do more in terms of their green energy or their waste, you know, incinerators. And you know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but on the global scale, we're also seeing that as a as a way to leapfrog. I mean, in a country like Zimbabwe, where we're putting solar panels on health, the health clinics were not emitting because they basically had a, a small diesel fuel. But if you can build health systems that are climate, you know, you can do something on mitigation from a climate perspective with the health care. Uh, component. And I think doctors have a lot of influence into their kind of administration on what you expect. I don't know if you're doing Yeah, that. so actually, yeah. <laughs> well, now that you mention it. So in my yeah. hospital, so that's something I've been really pushing is another thing that doctors can do, um, where we have this special role, right? We can talk about the real health effects. And we have influence in our own institutions. And healthcare is a very energy intensive field. And so, um, Ari's been active in doing that kind of work at his institution, and I've, I've been active. I've, I work at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and we are now uh, considering uh, a power purchase agreement to offset our entire carbon footprint. Um, and that came in part as a result of clinicians like myself knocking on the doors of the, the people who make decisions about utilities. So it's a funny little connection, right? We don't usually talk to each other. The back, and that'll be our mm -hmm. last question. Uh, we're going to follow up on something you said about Austin, um, about hurricanes really aren't a big issue for them, but the people who flocked them after. Um, in Florida, we had Hurricane Irma knock at an entire hospital in Keats. And it, for anyone who needed care, they had a helicopter to Miami. And that was just a huge thing. It's been three years, and they're just now rebuilding the hospital. It's been a tent for three years. Who is, when you go to these hospitals and ask if they're preparing for states, who's doing it well? Who is prepared to have a <coughs> system that works after a storm or after, you know, impacts of climate change? So we had funded uh, 16 states and two cities um, to assess the risks of climate change, identify the biggest threats, put uh, systems in place to protect against those threats. Um, um, so it's a small sample. 
Uh, Florida was one of our grantees, and they were doing a great job <clears throat> until somebody left and this and that and moved around. And um, actually, the state wanted to drop the grant. Uh, actually, they did drop the grant. They said uh, there was it was too much um, pressure, and the two PIs were awesome. One went to Tennessee, one went to Oregon, and then a colleague of mine who's at FSU picked it up, and he's doing great work too. But it's not really it's for the state, but not by the state, uh, which is kind of the wrong sort of you, you want the state to do it because that's the capacity you're building, not at a, a university. Um, New York City's doing an excellent job. Um, Oregon, uh, Minnesota. Um, but these are just, you know, it needs to, this type of activity needs to be happening right now, or five years ago, in every state in the country and every large city. We had developed this BRACE framework as the um, process by which you will arrive at something that is evidence-based and you know what you're looking at. Um, and it's, the funding in Congress has survived, but the support for it, uh, this is the only um, evidence-based adaptation plan planning framework in the world, and, and was the first. And the government of Canada and uh, Public Health England has adopted it and are using it vigorously in their places. But in the United States, the, um, the effort has kind of <laughs> gone away. Thank you so much. Lunchtime.